Welcome, Faith Church. Hey, good to have everybody here today. So glad you came. Take your Bibles out and turn to Luke chapter 10, if you would, today. Luke chapter 10. So good to have you. We welcome our online campus, and uh, thank you for watching and tuning in today as well. As you can tell, we're having some technical difficulties with our lights. We apologize for that, but uh, we'll figure it out this week sometime. It's okay. The mics are working. You can hear, and uh, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So good to have every one of you here. If you're a guest, thank you for coming and being with us today. Great to have you this morning. Um, yeah, it, it, March Mission, March Madness, uh, great time. I, I like basketball, love to watch it. And uh, but it's more exciting to see our our kids, our boys and girls, get excited about missions. And so there is a goal out there. You can just pick and and choose an envelope and fill it back up, and then all that goes. And I think the most important thing about BGMC. Uh, Maybe not, buying literature to take around the world may be the most important, but it also it's training our boys and girls early about missions. And last year when we did this in March, I think there were about 14 boys and girls that said, I wanna be a missionary and I wanna go around the world. So as you see this morning by bringing George in and uh, March Mission Manus and all that, we believe very, very missions is central to everything we do right here at Faith Church. Let me read a scripture to you. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 20. We are therefore Christ ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Now, just think about that for a moment. You're an ambassador. Everybody in the room is an ambassador. We are Christ ambassadors. That's who we are. That's what God has told us we are. Let me give you a definition of who you are. An ambassador is the highest ranking official from one country or kingdom who represents the kingdom of another country. In other words, we're here as representatives of that heavenly kingdom for God. We represent him right here on the earth. Uh, the United States, you know, when, when you, uh, the United States has now 180 ambassadors in 180 different countries around the world. We're in 180 countries. We have embassies there, ambassadors there. And the ambassador does not represent himself, but only the wishes of the president or the king who sends them out. And so we don't represent ourselves. We represent our king and our Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's exactly who we represent. And so every one of us are called to make a difference. That was referenced earlier. We're called to make a difference. And so my question is, as you are an ambassador, what is God calling you to do? What does God want from us? What does God call for us? What does God ask us to do. We're gonna be looking at Luke chapter 10. We're looking at a model for how God reached out and reached the villages and the cities all around him. We're gonna look at what we're gonna be doing as a church is we are gonna send and go out into the streets and on April 2nd, we're gonna knock on doors, touch every house in this area and reach them with the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. So first of all, I want you to notice the Lord's assignment. The Lord's assignment. Now in... Uh, in Luke chapter nine and verse number one, it says he called the 12 together. He says, I gave them power and authority. We sang about that power and authority this morning. We, we, we talked about that power and authority over all the demons and to cure diseases and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. Now, in Luke chapter 9, he's got 12. These are his 12 disciples. He says, you're going to go. I want to send you out. You're representing me. I want you to knock on doors. I want you to go to the villages. I want you to proclaim the kingdom of God, heal the sick, cast out demons, do all the kingdom stuff, and, and bring the good news of the kingdom of God. Now, if, if that was the only chapter we had, you might surmise in your mind, you know what? This, this call to go out and take the gospel, it was for the 12 disciples. Or this call to take the gospel to, uh, into all the worlds is, is, is just for the clergy. It's just for the religious leaders. It's just for the pastors. It's just for the teachers in the church. It's, it's really not for me, right? You, you, might, you might think that. But now let's take it a step further. Go one chapter over to Luke chapter 10. And with that, we'll stand together and let us look at this passage this morning. And it says, and after this, one chapter later, after he just sent out the 12, 
After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him into every town and place where he was to go. And he told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Now, if that's your sales pitch, I don't know if I want to sign up. I don't know if I want to be, get slaughtered by the wolf out there. He says, I'm sending you out, 72. You see, he's expanding already his outreach from now 12, and then it goes to 72. He says, I want you to even pray for more laborers in my harvest field. As ambassadors, it includes every single one of us. Let us pray. Father, we love you so much. We thank you for your presence today. We thank you for your word today. And I pray you'll open up our hearts and minds to receive what you have for us. May there be a special anointing of your Holy Spirit. Thank you, God, that we are called, chosen, and sent. And we'll give you the praise for this service today. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. God bless you. The grapes that are capable of making a fine wine are very fragile and need to be cultivated and protected. It's not easy work. If you've ever been to a vineyard, you've probably seen something like this. Winemakers graft vines into rootstocks. This helps give the vines the structure and strength they need to produce grapes. Once the vines are grafted, they need to be watered regularly fertilized, protected from frost, pests, and other elements. But what really makes the grapes grow? Can the farmers give enough grit and willpower to make grapes appear on the vines? Of course not. This is something that happens naturally. All the farmers can do is set up everything and then let creation do its work. This is a picture of what it is like for those who share Jesus with others. Some of us sow the initial seeds, some cultivate the relationship, and then others water it. But only God can do a work in a person's heart. Luke chapter 10 describes this idea as Jesus sends out 72 workers amongst the harvest field. In this passage, Jesus tells his disciples, all of the different ways people might respond to the good news. Some people will welcome it with open arms. Others will be amazed and ask for miracles. And then there will be those who are unsure and reject it entirely. In the story of the 72, the important thing Jesus emphasizes is for us to do what we are tasked with. If people reject you, shake the dust off your feet and move on. If God does a work in a person's heart, we can remember it's not about us saying the perfect thing or praying the perfect prayer. It's God doing a miracle in a person's heart, and we get to play a part. Paul explains this in his own words in 1 Corinthians when he says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. For the farmer who works in the vineyards, there is a lot of hard work, and then trust that nature will do its part. But for us who share the good news, it's bigger than trust. We are collaborators. We are co-workers with God's plan to rescue and bring hope to humanity through His Son, Jesus. That means we don't have to feel the pressure to make everything grow through our own good works. We simply have to do the work of the harvest and then marvel at the mystery of the miracles God will do through our work. Amen. There are two commands in those first three verses that he gives the 72. The first is ask the Lord for labors. Pray. 
Pray for laborers that they'll go into my harvest field. Pray, he, he, he goes from 12 and then he goes to 72 and he says, that's still not enough. We need more laborers, we need more workers. So pray that more laborers will answer the call. And the second command is found in verse three, go, go, pray, go. Both commandments for us. He says, I am sending you out. I want you to go. And so those are the two commands. And I will tell you, both those things are desperately needed in the church today. We need to obey and pray and we need to obey and go. And by the way, before we begin to go out in the streets, I'm encouraging all of you to begin to walk up and down your neighborhood, walk up and down your streets and begin to pray for every one of those houses on that block. We have an app out there that you can check the QR code and find out who's living around you and you can keep up with how you're doing reaching those neighbors that God has placed around the home where you live in. Go and pray, go and pray. Jesus says 72 are gonna be sent out. And then he tells us why. He says 72, but we're gonna need more workers because we still don't have enough. And he tells us because the harvest is plentiful. There are so many People that need to know about the Lord Jesus Christ. The harvest is plentiful. It is ripe. It is ripe right now. It is ready for a harvest. 35% of the people in South Carolina consider themselves to be evangelical. That means they, they have some kind of knowledge of Jesus Christ, may attend a church. In most cases, they may or may not even be saved. But that means 65% of the people that are living all around us do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, do not attend a church, and need to hear the good news that we have that Jesus Christ saves and Jesus Christ loves them and Jesus Christ cares about them and where they're at. By just a show of hands, how many people in here would say, I know someone who is not saved? Raise your hand. I know somebody around me that doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ, right? And so, so we have that. And so the point is, Jesus is sending you. If there's somebody you know that doesn't know Jesus Christ, he says, go, pray, I am sending you out. These 72 discovered what Jesus Christ had done for them, that he could do the same thing for other people, and the news was great, and the news was good, and they wanted to share it wherever they went. They're no longer just considered fishermen or tax collectors or tradesmen or farmers or something else that might have been their vocation, but now they see them as ambassadors or evangelists sharing the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. That was their calling. That was what God had saved them for, that to share that good news of God's redemption and God's power. And the Bible says they, when they came back, and we'll get to it a little bit later, they returned with joy at what God had done. They were so excited to see what the fruit of their labors and the fruit of their effort was. And they came back saying, this thing works. It really works. It is good news. We saw demons cast out. We saw the sick heal. We see God do amazing things, amazing signs and wonders. We saw men and women set free. It works. And they came back rejoicing. Our ways of earning a living made different. We got every kind of trade and background and talent here, working all kinds of jobs all throughout this city. But our purpose, our primary purpose and mission is the same for every single one of us. People will say, Pastor, what, what, just tell me what the mission is for Faith Church. Reach the lost. Reach the lost. It's, it's not complicated. It's not rocket science. It's, it's reach the lost with the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's to see people come to know him and be discipled. In the Lord Jesus Christ, our purpose is the same. We are nothing less than liberators of people all around us with the good news we have. The, the second thing I want you to notice in this text is the, uh, the shepherd's protection. Look, if you would, again, at verse number three. And it says, there go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. An English officer made a hazardous journey to Tibet and uh, he was over there on assignment and he was on a vital mission for his government. And so he goes into that land. There have been many killed before him and after him and he's on this mission. And so someone asked him, what is the secret of your fearlessness? How could you go and serve in that land as an ambassador? And he made this statement, I have been set by an unimpeachable authority for a purpose which is sound. 
He says, if I get into a tight place, I have the government behind me, which would use all of its resources to see me through. The early Christians in this day and age are sent on a dangerous mission. And we know how the persecution would grow in the early church. It would first start at the hand of the Jews and the Sanhedrin and all those who said that's the only way. And so they persecuted the believers. But later, by the time of Nero, about AD 60, it spreads to Rome. And we have this Roman emperor in charge. And he makes it his purpose and mission in life to start killing believers. And there are literally millions that will be killed in those next 250 years. Millions who would die. If there was ever a, a case where you were sending the church out as lambs among wolves, it would have been that early church because of the persecution they faced and the danger they faced of the apostles. All of them were killed or martyred with the exception of John who probably lived to be about 90 some years of age. Everyone else was killed at the hands of the Rome. Very, very dangerous. They would need all the courage and assurance that they would need. And, and Jesus right here, he doesn't pull any punches. He doesn't say, hey, it's gonna be easy. Just sign up, do your time, do your duty. You can get off and then just, just no, no, no. You're going out like lambs among wolves. It's gonna be dangerous out there. But he says, don't worry about it. You got the good shepherd with you every step of the way. And as long as we have the good shepherd there, he's gonna take care of the lambs. Make sure they're gonna be okay. Now, I'm gonna tell you, when a lamb goes up against a wolf, I'm putting my money on the wolf. Now, and I'm not a betting man, so don't, don't look at me and, and don't send me any emails this week and say we're not supposed to gamble. I'm not, I'm not a betting man, but, but if you're putting money down, you're gonna put it on the wolf in just about every situation except one. And that's where the shepherd's standing right beside that wolf. And if we got the good shepherd with us, we can obey him and go out with courage and confidence because we know the Lord Jesus Christ is with us. Turn, if you would, to 1 Samuel chapter 17. I want to share a neat story with you. King David has uh, been, already been anointed by Samuel, and, uh, but he's still just a young teenager. And his father sends him to the battlefield where his brothers are at and you know the story, there's a Philistine giant out there in the middle of the valley and he's ridiculing the, uh, the God, he's ridiculing the armies of God, he's ridiculing the, the Israelites themselves. And so David comes up and he says, what's this giant out there doing taunting my God and talking about my God that way? And he says, is there not a cause? Isn't there anybody here who can go out and fight? And David says, well, I'll go, I'll go. And he keeps wanting to go out and fight this giant twice his size. The odds are insurmountable. And they bring him before the king. And with that, I pick up the story in 1 Samuel 17. Look, if you would, at verse number 36. And it says there, and, and David said to Saul, excuse me, start with verse 34. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping the father's sheep. In other words, King Saul says, you can't do this. You're not big enough. You're not a warrior. You're not a soldier, et cetera, et cetera. And David said to Saul, your king has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it. I struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. And when it turned on me, I seized it by the hair and I struck it and I killed it. Wow. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defiled the armies of the living God. Now, let me tell you, I, I don't know a whole lot about animals, but I do know that a lion can take a wolf. And I do know a bear can take out a wolf. I, a lion and a bear are a lot scarier, right, than, than wolves are, okay? So we know that if you've been to the zoo, you know that. Just look at their size and you can figure out who's gonna win that battle. But it was the shepherd's job to protect the flock. And David said, I was a shepherd and I was there and I was watching over the flock and when the lion came out, I took the lion down. When the bear came out, I took the bear down. But look at verse 37. David knew exactly where his protection came from. He says, the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion, it wasn't because David was all that strong or that brave or that, or that powerful in himself. The Lord, the Lord protected me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, and he will rescue me from the hand of this 
Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and the Lord and the Lord be with you. The bottom line is the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not fear what man can do to me. He's got a rod and a staff to comfort me. He'll go with me every single step of the way of my journey. And so when I go and I knock on that door and I talk to that person at work and wherever I'm at and I begin to share the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ, I've got the shepherd right there beside me every step of the way. He'll protect me from all the wolves. So the bad news is, you know what? I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. The good news is, it's okay. I'm there. I'm with you. I'm the shepherd. I'll protect you. When we get sent out to a hostile word as Christ ambassadors, we are not sent alone. We have the great shepherd of the sheep who is with us. The odds in the early church were clearly stacked against them. Many of them would still lose their lives, would be persecuted in some way or another, but the Lord, through the Lord, that early church overcame. And even though the ground was, was kind of fertilized with the blood of all those martyrs who went before us, the church just kept exploding. They couldn't stop the church and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as soon as they kill someone, there will be two more who'd be saved to rise up and take their place. There was no stopping the early church because they wanted the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Lord. Man cannot fight against God. Man cannot fight against God, nor fight successfully against the man of God who knows that God is with him. There is no way. He has, the odds are clearly stacked against our enemies. Listen to Hebrews 13 and 20. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep. Look at that, the great, great, great shepherd of the sheep. That's who we serve and that's who we're going out under and I guaranteed his protection. And when Jesus sends you like lambs among wolves, know that you have the great shepherd. He is there with you every single step of the way so you can fulfill all your duties as that ambassador of his kingdom and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only do you need to have the shepherd's protection, but you need the shepherd's authority. Turn, if you would, to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, look if you would at verse number 15. And it says there, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe in my name, in my authority, under my authority, in my name. They will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. I have the authority and power going with me of the Lord Jesus Christ. He protects me, but he gives me his name. And miracles happen with the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. Unless you go and build on that authority, everything else collapses. Rome thought it could easily exterminate the early church and wipe it out and, and, and stop that witness of the Lord Jesus Christ. But undergirding these simple people was the conviction that God had spoken to them. God sent them out with his name and his power and authority and they had his protection as the good shepherd and they went all around the world and they turned the world upside down with the good news of Jesus Christ. When an ambassador of the United States speaks to another nation, he has the authority of the United States behind him. And so wherever that embassy is, wherever he's dealing business, wherever he's in those countries, he's under the authority of the entire U.S. government. And if something happens to our ambassadors, then the U.S. government steps in and does something about it and brings them to a point of safety in, in most cases. I think there's a few times we slip. But anyway, theoretically, we've got the whole government of the United States behind our embassies and ambassadors that are scattered in those 180 80 countries around the world. As the Lord sends you out to your mission field, to your place of work, to your neighborhood, wherever you are at, 
He is sending you both with his protection and with his authority. And like David, he will rescue you from every wolf. And if it's a lion that comes your way, he's able to take care of lions. And if it's a bear that comes your way, he'll take care of the bears. And whatever it might be, God is with you with his protection and authority. And the fourth thing I want you to notice in this passage is the Lord's process. The Lord's process. Let me, let me ask you a question. How many people in the room are married? Let me see your hand. Okay, a lot of you, probably most of you in here are married. So let me ask you a survey and we'll just kind of do this by show of hands. How many married your bride or groom or whatever the case may be within three months after you first met them? You met them and before three months expired, you were already married, raise your hand. Any, any early adapters right here just found somebody? Oh man, you're a brave lady, Irvin and Betty, oh my goodness. And how long, Irvin and Betty, how long you guys been married now? How many years? 50 years in May, give it up for these guys. 50 years in May. And they met and were married before three months time were up. So it can work. It can happen. How, how many are in the group? You met somebody within, uh, after three months, within a year. Uh, three months to a year, that's how long it took you to meet somebody and court and date and get engaged and all that. My hand's up in that crew. I, I, uh, I, I met Jeannie and I said, Phew, that's the one for me. And it didn't take long, and so we, uh, we first talked in January the 1st, or New Year's, Eve, New Year's Day, maybe New Year's Eve, maybe I, that night, and we were married in September. So nine months later, she became my wife, and, and he who finds a wife finds a good thing, and I found a great thing, and so I'm gonna hang on to her. And uh, in fact, this year will be 13 years uh, for us. So... So what happened, and so in that time, we dated, we courted, we talked on the phone a lot because she was in Wisconsin and I was down here and we did that whole thing. How, ma how many were married uh, between one and two years after you first met? Let me see your hand. Okay, a lot, lot others in here. How many, how many were, were met somebody and got married after two years? It took you that long to get married. Let me see those hands up. Anything over two years? A lot of you, okay. A lot of people are waiting longer and longer today, I think, to get married. And so, so what happens is you know that in a relationship like that, it takes time to get to know somebody, unless you're like Irvin and Betty. Man, they know right away. But in most cases, it takes time. And so it starts with the introduction. Someone introduces, you meet them, your heart starts to flutter, you think this might work. And then uh, friends, are, you become friends, right? And so you talk to each other and you become friends and you get closer together and then there's that dating process that takes place and you go out on the dates and do all that kind of thing. And then the engagement and you get engaged and you wait a period of time. You, you give her a ring, she gives you a ring and you're all engaged. No, you just give her a ring. The guys don't get an engagement ring. You give her a ring and, uh, and you get, you know, you just, and then there's an engagement period until you can plan the wedding out, get it all set. And then bam, you make that covenant, right? with that lady for the rest of your life, that person for the rest of your life. You enter into a covenant relationship with your husband and wife and you do that lawfully and legally and it's an amazing, amazing thing. Because what happens is you meet this right person and then it hits you, I can't live without that person. I, I gotta have that person in my life, right? And we get all romantic and it's, it's gonna happen. And so the wedding day comes. But I wanna tell you, that's only the second most important relationship in your life. The second most. Why do we think the most important relationship, the relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will always be instantaneous? Sometimes a person hears about Jesus and, and that, and they, they, but they don't know him. They don't know who he is. They don't know anything about him. And, and I will tell you, that in your life is the most second most important relationship in your life. But sometimes it takes time for a person to know who God is before they know him personally, before they invite them to come into their heart, before they enter into that covenant relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. He already made the covenant with us by his shed blood. Before they enter into that relationship with Jesus, sometimes it takes a lot of time. And so the Bible describes this as times of sowing, 
the seed and watering the seed. And then there's that later time that, that comes. It's the reaping the harvest. But it doesn't, you don't just reap the harvest necessarily the first time you introduce someone to your friend Jesus Christ, right? It takes time. It can be a process. It can be a journey. The journey starts with knowing about God, and then that journey hopefully will culminate in that person knowing God for themselves in a real intimate, a dynamic, exciting relationship where they surrender their heart and lives totally to the Lord Jesus Christ, that committed relationship. It's a process. I want you to look at the process a little bit that Luke 10 talks about. Go back there if you would. Luke chapter 10, look at verse five. Let's pick our story up there. Luke 10 and verse five. There we go. Um, and it says, and when you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. This is a little bit what we're gonna be doing when we go to the homes and knock on the doors on April 2nd. Peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you, okay? Jump down to verse number nine. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. Isn't that, isn't that awesome? So there's three things we're gonna be doing and three things you need to do when you encounter other people and you wanna to begin to share about the Lord Jesus Christ. The first thing you do is you speak peace to them. You speak peace over them. And so you're gonna knock on the door and we're gonna say, hey, we're, uh, I'm Tom and this is Sally and we're, we're gonna talk to you about Jesus today and, and, and we, we wanna love our city and we wanna share with you what God has done for us. And we just wanna pray. We're praying for our neighbors. We're praying for our community. And as you begin to pray for the, each neighbor that you go to who opens their door and says, I'd love prayer today. I need prayer today. You just begin to pray for them right there on the spot. And what you're doing is you're doing what they did, what Jesus did in Luke 10, Speak peace to them. Bring the peace of God to them. If they say, no, thank you, I'm busy, uh, you know, sayonara, whatever they say, and shut the door in your face, the Bible says that peace will return back onto you. And so it's okay, you have been obedient and you keep moving and flowing and functioning in the peace of God. And then it says in verse number nine, heal the sick. And so what, you be, what we'll do is we'll address their area of brokenness. And there are broken people all around us and they're hurting and broken and you'll, you'll address that area of brokenness and they say, can I, can I pray for that broken marriage? Can I pray for that addiction? Can I pray for your body right now that God will heal you? And you begin to pray right then on the spot for that area of brokenness in their life and you bring the hope of Jesus. And then we proclaim the good news of the kingdom. And I, I'm just believing that there'll be some people say, I wanna know more about Jesus. Tell me more about why you're here. Tell me more about what he means to you. Tell me more about who he is, and what he did for me. And then you begin to share. And next week, next, next Sunday, we're gonna go, just, just to give you a real basic, simple plan of salvation that you can use wherever you go and whoever you're talking to, but it's, it's the pattern. Paul talked about the process in 1 Corinthians chapter three. Look at it, and we alluded to you earlier, and you saw on the videotape as well. 2 Corinthians chapter three, or 1 Corinthians chapter three, excuse me, verse number six. I planted seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. Ultimately, all new births happen because of the work of the Holy Spirit in making it grow. So neither one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. So we'll talk to some, you'll talk to some at work, you'll talk to some of your co and some of your neighborhoods, you'll talk to some of your friends and your buddies and all that, and, and, and some people will reject you. But ultimately, if they receive you and you dialogue with them and you begin to talk and share and love them and you serve them and we share the good news of Jesus Christ as they begin to receive that, ultimately, still it's not you that's saving them. It's only the Lord Jesus Christ that can do that work. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they each will be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field and you are God's building. When we go out as his ambassadors, we begin to share our story and we begin to share our testimony. We talked about the power of your testimony in week one. 
And we begin to share the good news of who Jesus Christ is and, and what he did in our hearts and lives. Understand that even if someone right there on the spot says, hey, I want to give my life to Jesus Christ, which is totally awesome when you get to help bring, bring in the harvest and reap the harvest, always know that someone has been praying for that person. Someone has been planting seed. Uh, you just came along at just the right time where you were able to reap the harvest. But the, the seed needed to be planted. The prayers needed to be prayed. People needed to sow into their lives. People needed to serve them and love them and minister life to them all throughout this journey of coming to know Jesus Christ for their Lord and Savior. You just came at the right time to bring in the harvest. And also know that if they, if they just listen to you a few minutes and say, I'm not interested now, don't want to talk anymore about it, you have planted some seeds or you've watered someone else's seeds and you've brought the love of Jesus Christ wherever you go. But all receive the reward. And what's the reward? It's not gold and silver and precious stones. It's much more important than that. The joy, the reward is seeing them coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we get to heaven, we'll all be there together and rejoicing together. That's our reward. Mm, 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 mm. The most loving thing we can do is direct someone to the knowledge of Jesus Christ more than anything else you'll ever do. We have a mindset that evangelism is all about closing the deal. We miss that necessary process that God can use to ultimately bring in the harvest, the process of sowing and watering and reaping. It's all essential for the harvest. I remember the first week we talked about the woman at the well. Listen to John 4, 36 again. Even now the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Our ultimate reward is seeing our friends come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. And know that they're gonna be in heaven with us for all eternity. I uh, turn back to Luke 10. Luke 10. And uh, look if you would. I wanna pick the story up in verse 17. I want you to hear their testimony service after they came back from the villages they were sent out 72, they come back, and by the way, when we get done on that Saturday morning, we're gonna come back together. You're gonna share the stories of who got to, who got to pray with and who you got to share with and someone that maybe accepted the Lord and, and what happened and the miracles that took place as you went out. We're gonna send you out in faith, believing that the same thing that happened to 72 will happen to ours that go. I think we have well more than that signed up right now and you'll get a chance to sign up today as well. But look at verse 17. Incredible story here. It says, uh, Luke, Luke 10, verse 17, and here it is. And the 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. Wow. Devils submit. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I've given you all authority. There's that authority again to trample on snakes and scorpions to overcome all the power of the enemy and nothing will harm you. There's the protection of our shepherd. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. That's an incredible statement. Can you imagine seeing all those miracles and you being so excited about what God had just done? And he said, but that's, that's not the main thing. Rejoice your names in heaven. In that verse, the word heaven is used twice. I, I, wanna, I wanna just draw a contrast here. The first time it's used is rejoice that your name, or the last time it's used in verse 20 is rejoice that your names are written in heaven. The first time it's used is in verse 18, where it says, and I saw Satan fall from heaven. Now listen to me. Our names are written in heaven, but as the 72 were sharing the good news and casting out devils and healing the sick, he says, I saw something in the spiritual realm. I saw Satan being cast down from heaven. Our names are there because I am in Christ Jesus. And the biggest rejoicing we'll ever do is knowing that I'm a child of God and I'm on my way to heaven. The, the second biggest rejoicing you'll do is knowing that your next door neighbor's also going to heaven and their names will be written there as well. But notice the dimensions that he talks about, he alludes to in Luke chapter 10. Your names are here, 
Satan has just dropped all the way down out of heaven. Now, to make it even more clear, when Paul writes the Ephesians church in chapter two, he says what? We are seated with Christ in the heavenly places or in the heavenly realms. Where is that? He says in Jesus Christ far above all principalities and powers and dominions and the rulers of darkness in heavenly places. So in Christ Jesus, I'm above the enemy. That means he no longer holds me in slavery. He no longer holds me in bondage. He can no longer hold me in fear. He can no longer hold me captive. I am free in Christ Jesus because I'm seated with him in heavenly places. So he, Jesus is saying, don't rejoice over your personal success, but rejoice that you belong to heaven, you belong to his kingdom, you are under his dominion, his throne, you are an ambassador for him, uh, your names are written down there, and even now, you're seated with him in a spiritual dimension in heavenly places, which made you victorious over all the power of the enemy. Our victory came from my position in Christ Jesus and the fact that I'm already there in the heavenly places and my name is already recorded there in the heavenly places. So no matter what the odds may seem against you, we are victorious over every single power of the enemy. Don't have to be afraid. We go in his authority, protection, power. My name's there. I'm already reigning over him. Three other times, I'm about to, we're about to close. Three other times, it talks about Satan being cast out of heaven. The first time we see a reference to that, you see it in three different places. You see it alluded to in Ezekiel and Isaiah, and you see it really pointed out in Revelation where it talks about Satan being cast out with one-third of the angels. So the one-third demonic forces followed Satan out of heaven. And the Bible describes them as being cast out. Revelation, cast out of heaven. The second time you see it alluded to is when Jesus Christ hung on the cross. And the Bible says in Colossians that on the cross, Jesus Christ disarmed, disarmed and made a public spectacle of Satan and all the demonic forces of hell. Cast down. And the third time you see that is going to be found again in the book of Revelation when it says, and Satan will be cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. And the fourth time is the one I just read to you. Every time a sinner repents and comes to know the Lord Jesus Christ, Every time a miracle is done, every time the power of Satan is broken in somebody's life, a devil is cast out, a demon is cast out. He's cast down again. Now listen, this, this church, we're gonna we want to take down the devil. I want to take him down. How do we do that? We begin to talk to people about Jesus. We talk to our neighbors. We pray for them. We lay hands on them. We watch them get healed by the power of God. We watch them open up their heart. We watch them get set free from drug abuse and, and all, all kinds of addictions that are out there. And we watch God do those miracles in our life. And every time that happens, I saw them fall like lightning. Every time a sinner repents and turns to God, the power of Satan is broken in their lives. Jesus reminded of his victory through his ambassadors, just like he would do it on the cross. He says now he's going to do it through us, his church. He's already done it on Calvary, operating under his power and protection. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Maybe you're here today and haven't asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart and life. Listen, you can do, you can do that today. I don't want to just say goodbye without first giving you a chance to say, hey, I need Jesus. I'm not sure I'm going to heaven. I don't really know. And if you don't know, most likely you're not because when you know Jesus Christ, you know that you know that you've been born again. So if you need the Lord, 
I want to pray for you. And it's just as simple as saying, you know what, Jesus, I need you. I need your forgiveness. I need your grace. I know I'm a sinner. I know I can't save myself. Come into my life. Father, I thank you for everybody here today. And I pray, God, if there are those who have not yet received you as Lord and Savior today, 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 they would ask you to come in, take away their sins, come in and live inside of them, be their Lord and Savior, we pray in Jesus' name. Now, after this service today, if you prayed a simple prayer like that for the first time, there'll be some altar workers down here. They'll pray with you. They'll show you in God's word how you can be saved. And, uh, and pray with you right then on the spot. And if you're here with a need of healing in your own body, there's something, you're going through a heavy trial or test, these altar workers, they'll be here to pray for you as well. Now, we're gonna send you out. And uh, April 2nd, we've already been sent. We've already been commissioned. But before we show you the, how that works, and Tim gives you a few more instructions, take a look at the video, how one Assembly of God Church did it in, I think, Seattle. So take a look. You know, when Pastor was saying that, you know, um, we're going to have a training doing evangelism, I thought it was just a training here at church, right? So it was kind of like, okay, and then Pastor um, David goes, oh yeah, and in a few minutes we're going to be going house to house. I was like, oh, house to house, oh my gosh, I haven't done that. Evangelism to us has always been a little bit of a challenge. We did not really have a um, system for evangelism uh, or even a structure. We were a little nervous. Both of us had never, had never really done anything like this. Not really was I a door-to-door, -door, not door-to-door -door person. To tell you the truth, I was gonna go home and come back later. I really was. We had gone out in twos, and my partner uh, and I had come across a, a woman who was actually watering her front lawn. So we walked and approached her and asked her uh, if we could pray for her. She was extremely uh, receptive and happy that somebody would even take the time to do so. One house, we told him, hey, uh, we're here in the neighborhood and we're praying for this community. And we were here to find out if there's something we can pray for you today. And he, you know, hesitate a little bit. And then he opened the door and let us, you know, touch him and prayed for him. And that was really awesome. We didn't have an opportunity to pray for anybody until the last house. A gentleman named Earl answered. And we said, um, hi, Earl, we want to let you know that you are awesome, and God thinks that you are awesome. If there's anything on your mind or your heart that you would like us to pray about, we'd like to pray with you. With the approach of prayer, people just seem to be very disarmed and more, more open, uh, receptive. I've already seen some confidence that now they can do this, and I'm encouraging them to um, really influence the people in the, their circle of influence just simply represent in love and in thoughtfulness and in approach. We have a responsibility to our, especially to our family, to our neighbors and our community that we need to share. I look forward to going out again to be able to pray for them. And I think if you just give it a shot, try it once, I think you, you too will just find this just a, a freedom to share. Amen. Church, can we all stand together? On behalf of everyone here at Faith, we want to thank you so much for joining us today. And we hope you were blessed by the proclamation of God's Word. I want to take a moment and speak directly to anyone who is feeling led to ask Jesus Christ to be the Lord and Savior of your life. I know you may be battling some doubt, some uncertainty in regards to this decision. But that tug you are feeling is God beckoning you toward Him, calling you by name. His death and resurrection open the only path that can bring you into right relationship with God. And regardless of where you have been or what you have done, He will forgive you of all of your sins and transform every area of your life as you seek Him with a whole heart. Making Jesus your Lord and Savior starts with first repenting of your old way of life and abandoning it completely so that He can show you all that you were purposed for and meant to do with Him and through Him. If you are ready to make this decision, 
I want you to simply repeat this statement after me. Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God and that you died and were resurrected on the third day. I ask that you please forgive me for my sins and come and be the Lord and Savior of my life. From this day forward, I commit my life to you, and I ask that you guide me by your hand and correct me when I go astray. I love you and will obey you. Amen. To all who just said that prayer, I want to congratulate you on making the single most important decision of your life. And we here at Faith are rejoicing with you, along with all of heaven. If I can encourage you, please head over to faithishere.org slash salvation for important next steps on your journey with Christ. Since September of 2020, over 87 people have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior online. And this would not have been possible without your generous giving. If you're interested in supporting our online ministry, head over to faithishere.org slash give for a variety of giving options. Lastly, don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can stay connected with everything the Lord is doing through Faith Church. We sincerely hope you have a fantastic rest of your week and may you experience the love of Jesus more powerfully every moment of every day. Amen.